Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, lots of people. I'm happy to see so many people. And of course, I have to thank uh, Malcolm, and David, and Karen because they were the first uh, in Cardiff uh, organization to bring this work to Europe. And after that, uh, it went to the Lyon Biennale, which is an art biennale in general. This is not uh, only a photographic project. It deals with other uh, disciplines and other, it's in a border within photography, intervention, art, installation. It's a bit uh, not uh, classic in so far. It combines different techniques and different uh, systems or to work it, with a purpose to convey uh, an idea. Therefore, rather than being classical to one discipline, I am more uh, attached to what I want to say. Therefore, I do whatever discipline I need to do that. In fact, there is also a sound piece that is part of this project. That it's not for today because the opening is so difficult to hear. But yesterday, when we gave a talk uh, in the university, I passed, uh, projected these images with the sound. The sound contains speeches of the 60s by different uh, leaders like, uh, and philosophers like Herbert Marcuse, uh, Martin Luther King, Daniel Convendit, Rudy Duchke, or Che Guevara, that you can listen while you see the work. Therefore, it is kind of mixed with photography, intervention, and sound. Uh, everything works together. Today, uh, we, you will have the sound of myself, so it's different. Uh, but anyway, the case is that uh, uh, what started this work was a very specific Latin American case, a very specific Latin American issue, which is also in this exhibition. For some reason, Malcolm has decided to do some sort of geographic distribution of the work. So Latin America is not mixed in the gallery as it is in the book. But my idea is to mix everything up. But we have the Latin American wall in the other gallery. Anyway, this happened in 2014 uh, in uh, Mexico. There was a kidnapping of a number of 43 students uh, of the Ayotzinapa school, which was, is a rural school in the Guerrero state of Mexico, where uh, with the complicity of police and military and some drug bands of the state, 43 uh, students were missing and they are still missing and there has been a lot of argument and mobilization in Mexico about that. So uh, um, I decided to take a picture of 1968 because in 1968 one of the main events that happened it was in Mexico, not only in Paris, and it is that in Mexico more than 200 students were killed in the Tlatelolco Square, La Plaza de las Tres Culturas, the square of the three cultures, were the three cultures that would be the original indigenous culture, the Spanish European culture, and a modernist culture that coexist in their architectures in this square, uh, gave the the, the situation where many students were uh, marching and there was a fierce uh, shooting by the military that killed more than 200 people. The list is still not known. So I wrote uh, in this image of 68, which was <clears throat> an image by Rodrigo Moya, who is a Mexican photographer that was shooting at that time. Um, if Tlatelolco, which was this massacre of students, would have been judged, Ayotzinapa wouldn't have happened. That means since Ayotzinapa, since uh, Tlatelolco was never judged, we don't even know how many students were, there was no judgment, then uh, Ayotzinapa could happen. So this was the statement. And that brought me back to the 60s. So the first uh, work uh, is uh, about Mexico. But then when I was already with the file material in the 60s, uh, I started to spread and work further into this idea. Let me tell you that this work of intervening archival photography with crayon and color is something that I've been doing for many years. And particularly in 1996, like 22 years ago, 
I made uh, an intervention of the picture of my own college class, the, my class. The picture is called the class. The piece is called the class. It is a traditional class picture, but it is, uh, I wrote on it because uh, 20 years ago, it was the 20th anniversary of the Argentinian military coup. So we got together in our school and we counted how many victims had we had from the school, how many students from the school were victims of the dictatorship. We needed 20 years to be able to make this count. So we made an event in the school and we read their names for the first time. At that time we had 98 names, well, now we have 110. And uh, well, that was a very important event for the school. So we made a, a, a exhibition of photographs. I had been shooting uh, my classmates uh, for portraits, talking about, thinking about identity. It was like a short essay about the pass of time. And in order to make that, I had blown up uh, the picture of the class to like 1.80 to two meters, a big print. And I wrote on that print the fate of each one of my classmates, particularly Claudio and Martin, who were the two victims, the two disappeared of my class. So with this uh, text, I hanged the picture in the school as part of the exhibition. It wasn't meant to be art. It was just an idea to transmit the, uh, the visually to narrate the history of our generation to the new generation of the same school so they quit could somehow identify with it through a visual uh, mean and a brief pieces of text. And uh, they could think, OK, this could have happened to me if I was then there. It is a process of how learning that more emotionally than uh, rationally, because I believe that art has to convey a more emotional uh, feelings. And that's the way in which people understand. OK, so this piece that didn't mean to be art at that time became art later because it was shown in several galleries. And now it is in the maze, some of the most important museum collections in the world, like in the Tate in the UK or in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, or in the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. It's a, in our national museum in Argentina, Colombia, Brazil. It became a classic way or an alternative way of narrating violence through an indirect approach, which generally works better than a direct one in art, I believe. OK, so this writing of the picture, this fact that I intervened, the archival image was already somehow legitimized by these institutions. But for many years, I didn't work with this system until now when I came to the 68 work, and I started researching for three and a half years, three years, the images of the most important events in 68 around the world. For this, I have a particular professional experience because I've been running a picture agency for 30 years called Latin Stock, which was founded in 1986 and finished two years ago in 16 because there's no more business in copyright at this point only engineering machines, but not copyright for the photographer. So after 30 years, we just closed that. But for 30 years, I worked with all the picture agencies or many of the picture agencies of the world. So I know and have access to the sources of these images. So therefore, this picture of Amsterdam is sourced in Hollande Hukte, which is an editorial agency that I knew, Luis Sal, who was the founder and was dead a few years ago. And now there is a foundation. I mean, Remembering his work in photography, in particular in Holland, for instance, it is through a relationship with a long-standing picture agency in Holland that has this material. Same thing in Italy. I mean, or other sources are university files, as the one in Ghent, uh, in Belgium, which is a picture from the University of Ghent. Uh, some are pictures taken by the police which is the case in Australia, Melbourne, Sydney, and Lithuania. And I believe they are here as well. They were uh, pictures, uh, the Lithuanian ones, taken by the KGB. If you want to 
look for those images in Moscow, in Russia, you cannot get them. But since Lithuania became independent and a group of uh, Lithuanian Photographers Association invited me to have the show in Kaunas uh, later this year, they searched their national files and the pictures of the KGB were there. Each picture, each uh, individual work has its own history of research, which uh, starts with looking for the image in low res, but all these images are not appropriated. They are licensed from the photographers, from the agencies, or from the universities, or from, in the case of the police images of Lithuania, they are national files of Lithuania. In the case of the police images in Australia, they are from a production company that searched those uh, files to make a TV series on the 60s in Australia, an Australian organization. So each one has its own history, and each one is licensed. This means that I, uh, one of the few things that I believe in that is right is copyright. And I believe that, uh, rather than copyleft, I believe that photographers should be remunerated for their rights and for the work. And that's why these pictures are not mine. I was 13 in 68. I wasn't traveling around the world. Uh, although these ideas influenced me a lot along my life, all the ideas of 68 that were very uh, revolutionary, changed uh, the approach, uh, openness, uh, freedom, uh, sex, uh, openness, all sorts of new roads that were to be uh, followed, and that was very interesting uh, in that time, and it influenced many generations afterwards. That's why I called this work the fire of ideas, because well, fire somehow spreads. Uh, although, in fact, the name came because in the gallery that I was showing, there was a fireplace, and finally came the fire of ideas. But uh, the uh, ideas of the time is what uh, I want to bring back to discussion with this work, because I believe that they were more interesting than the ideas we are discussing today. In terms of, at that time, the future looked better Everybody thought that the future would be something better, and now we don't. We think that the future will be whatever, a shame. We don't know. It's like a question mark, and probably going in a negative direction. Therefore, I believe that bringing back the ideas of sexual freedom, participation of the youth in a political debate, access to more democratic uh, discussion and openness uh, that were somehow uh, in the 68 uh, movement are good to be discussed now. This is a work on 68 that is done contemporarily. It's a vision of the 68 today. I am participating in several shows with this work and most of the other work is of the 60s, which is great. But there haven't been so much uh, uh, projects or pieces that deal with the 60s today. That's why the project is uh, having a lot of exhibitions this year. I will have it like in 10 different places in Europe. But this is because, uh, strangely enough, no French uh, artist or, uh, of today have focused their work in what happened 50 years ago. But uh, I did because I believe that what happened then is somehow very important to see and to review today. And this is an attempt to bring that into action, to do this relecture, re-reading, and bringing these ideas in a way back uh, to life. Okay, so this is the, I will speak about a few of the images. Each one, I mean, this work is not a work, I mean, you, it has several layers. Because after I research the image, and I look for the rights of the image, the, the different steps in each. Now I'm looking for a picture here in Scotland in the, Clyde uh, shipbuilders strike, uh, which was in 71. We have a possibility of finding one. Okay, we started looking. Okay, it was in 71. It's within the time range that I moved from, from 66 to 72. We still need to get the copyright. I still need to study the case, read a book, or read uh, the web and know more about it. Uh, because in each uh, work, aside of getting the image, I have to study what happened, so I can extract from that uh, know, 
knowledge or from that information the most relevant uh, elements that I believe that are to be introduced into the picture if they are not in the picture yet, which can be some uh, of the words, words of order of the time or some of the ideas, and then I write them either on the print or down in the caption, which is part of the work. The work is total, it includes uh, the picture, the painting, the text that is originally in the print, the text that I add, and the caption. Everything is one. And therefore, when you read, on his, when you look at the images, you won't have all the information because it's impossible. It's one piece, 60 by 90, only a few things fit in one frame. But if you are interested, for instance, in this Dutch image, you will know about the Provo movement. The Provo movement in 67 started a new way of thinking of a wide area sector of the Dutch youth. That was probably much before the joints were legal there. But uh, that started an openness in Dutch society towards, uh, let's say, very liberal ideas. Uh, and uh, they started, for instance, the squatting thing of occupying uh, buildings started, was started by the Provo movement in 67. Then it's extended to Germany, Europe at large. But they were the guys that had the idea. I mean, all these ideas look simple, but you still need to have them. They are not automatic. That occupying a place to create an art center is something uh, usual. Then I had this, sh this show in Zurich last week, and uh, they asked me for a piece. I finally researched what happened in the 60s in Zurich, and there was in 68 an occupation of a, a big magazine, Globus, to create a cultural center in Zurich in 68. That was probably related with what happened in Amsterdam before, in a way or another. And if it is not, it is the spirit of the time that is going around, what, what the Germans call the, something in German. Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist. Yeah, of course. But I, I, my German is not, not good. Anyway, the case is that uh, you see the image and then you know about the Provo and then you can start digging into it in the web or looking for books or the photographers that shot those movements. Now, I was in Holland for a week uh, in the jury of the WordPress photo and I knew more about the Provo movement and I want to do a picture now, uh, research a picture in Antwerp and, and I will also have to show in Brussels. Therefore, now I'm more interested in digging into it. Although my galleries have recommended me to stop the the essay in the 40 images it has in the book, I will not obey this instruction and I will continue because the galleries don't have the last word, fortunately. Okay, so then this is Paris. Of course, Paris uh, was one uh, of the main uh, and certainly the more recognized event. This is one, this image is in, in the Science Po uh, University. It is also one of the images in the essay, there are several of them in which the women are at the front. Here we have the women at the front as we have them in Rio, in Sao Paulo, or in Bangladesh, which is something interesting because this is the 60s. I mean, there were no people with third or fourth sex at that time. It was different, I mean, or it wasn't a public discussion about sexual identity. Uh, and uh, the, the women were not politically as publicly active probably as they are today, but apparently they really were, and that's what these images show. So each uh, image in this case, for instance, it says everything now. Short ideas, we want everything now. It's short, but in order to achieve it, it may be a lot of work to get everything now. Uh, so we see the cameras here. I mean, all the details that somehow relate to the present, uh, the, the transmission, the live transmission of an event was already happening 50 years ago. And if you go into the details, I mean, let me, here it says, bourgeois, you have understood nothing. Okay. This is the beginning of a long fight. Eventually, it didn't finish yet. So 
these are just brief, uh, brief texts, but they show the spirit of the time, and you can go further into it. And uh, after I have licensed the right of the image to use it in art, which is a chapter, I mean, as a professional picture agent that founded a picture agency in which 170 people work in 10 countries, that is a big thing, I am very familiar with agreements, rights, what can be done, what cannot be done, what has to be signed in order to use an image, how you can use it, what the credit has to say. In each image, you have the credit of the photographer when it is known, or the source, it is completely recognized in the work. But once that has been made, I do whatever I want with the picture. I don't have to negotiate, neither with the photographer, nor with the agency, nor with my wife, nothing. I just work on the issue and do what I think makes uh, the work. So here we have London, we have two of London. I always, uh, when I think it's interesting, extend the border of the image to put the whole piece of text I hear, say Vietnam. The Americans go home. This was a call made by Sir Bertrand Russell, Vanessa Redgrave, and Tariq Ali in 68 against the war in Vietnam. This is probably the march to Grosvenor Square where the, un the, American, University, the American embassy was. And what is it interesting for me, uh, as a Latin American, I don't need to say Argentinian, but it happens to be, that uh, this is March, uh, March 18th, 1968. Che Guevara had been murdered in October 8th, 67, only five or four months before March, or five months. And then this is probably one of the first times in which the image of El Che is in the streets, and it is in London. With this particular image that Corda took and that the publishing, uh, the Italian publisher Feltrinelli made public after the Che's death, and that became the most published and most seen image of the 20th century. No image has been published and reproduced as much as the portrait of the Che Guevara, and it is in London only a few months after his uh, killing. I mean, all these are details that talk not only about the time, but also about circulation of images, how images circulate, and how they were spread and the role of images in public and political action, which I believe is very important, particularly today when messages that don't contain images are not seen at all by the young uh, audience. Uh, if you receive a message or a text or something that is, doesn't have an image, it's more likely that m my daughters or my son won't even open it. They just don't care. You need an image. Therefore. I believe that working with archival images, with historical images to narrate history, maybe artistically manipulated like this, or maybe just with the photographs of the time, maybe the only way in which the younger generations will have any access to history. Otherwise, it's only a very small elite that goes to whatever, the university, a lecture yesterday. But for a massive <coughs> audience of students and of young people, photography and uh, the images of the facts may be absolutely necessary for these to be understood or listened or somehow to call some interest of the younger generations in them. And at the same time, <clears throat> the massive use of photography uh, enables a more fluent and, uh, let's say, uh, direct contact with visual uh, materials. I mean, I believe that we, I mean, the people that are visually professional, uh, with a, we've been working with visual culture for all our lives, uh, have a responsibility towards education and teaching uh, and trying that visual education becomes state of the art in all the different levels of education because of how much photography is now being used. And it's like a central part in language and in communication. Therefore we should be trained to use photography. So this is a way in which uh, I work on this. So then we have Rome, uh, in London, uh, Paris, uh, Amsterdam. This particular image on China, I mean, at that time, 
which is the Cultural Revolution, all the people with the Red Book of Mao. And this time, this was officially, generally all the, all the marches are against the government for social change, for more access to education, democracy, and so on. In this case, it's not. But seen from today, for China today, this is completely subversive. So it wasn't then, but it is now. Therefore, I can put it. Uh, because they wouldn't show this today. They could have shown it then, but they wouldn't show it today because they don't want this kind of books anymore in China. Okay, I chose two American, two American images. There may be more. There were events in San Francisco. There were... But I adjusted. I didn't want uh, the U.S. to have a predominant uh, role in this work, and I believe that the most important uh, quote and the most important presence is that one of Martin Luther King, who was murdered in 1968, only two months after he organized this march in Washington, the Poor People's March. Here it is his lieutenant, Ralph Abermathy, his right hand. He was also photographed in the picture, in the show of Hoppy, Hoppy, what, what was the name? Hoppy, Hoppy Hopkins. There was a picture of Ralph Abermathy visiting, was it Cardiff or London? London in the 60s with Martin Luther King. So we had him in both shows. And uh, he's organizing this uh, march. It is one of the first events in which Martin Luther King goes beyond the African-American community and he calls for the reunion of Native Americans, uh, African-Americans, Puerto Ricans, Mexican-Americans, whites. It becomes like a wider call to fight for economic justice, economic justice for all. And two months after this, he was shot in uh, the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, uh, Tennessee. So um, one of the main uh, events, political events of the 68, aside of the movement, was some of these shootings, eh? like Martin Luther King in uh, the United States or Rudy Dutschke in uh, Germany, that were both shot in the same year. Then we have some events in Chicago. Also, it's a mixture. It was a democratic convention. It was the war in Vietnam. And there was all the movement that came from California with the student power and freedom of speech. There is something funny I found in this picture because it says God is alive and well in Argentina. I don't know why. Then I've been <laughs> searching. We didn't have a pope at that time. Uh, that's uh, now. But uh, then I realized that this was a reference to some Nazi leaders that had flown to Argentina after the war. And that well, they may have been referring to Hitler as alive and well in Argentina, but it's not confirmed. My American uh, friends have, aren't, don't agree upon this <laughs> yet, so I'm not sure. But uh, uh, that happens when you see a picture. You go into it, and suddenly you start seeing details that are not in the history books, that are not in any written text, because this information remains in the image. And when you look at the image more carefully and you go into detail with it and you are researching the time as well, <clears throat> then you can get a wider understanding of what was going on through this visual documentation. This is uh, Toronto in Canada where uh, the American war objectors are marching. Let me tell you that aside of the anecdote of each image, all this work is an essay on language, insofar it contains a combination of word, image, text, color. With a color, I can manipulate the punctum of the image. I can modify where the eye goes. And I have this idea that there is a political decision in the intervention in what I want to outline of each photograph, what becomes more important. And since artistically I don't have any, any restriction or any, any line to follow, and as I said before, I don't have to negotiate this with anybody. I just study the case and try to find what is more relevant in each 
image and work to make it outstanding, to make it come. At the same time, the combination of black and white photography with handmade color, every single piece here is handmade. There is no uh, reproduction. Nothing is made by the lab, only the black and white image. The rest is all handmade, which if you look at carefully, you will see it makes a big difference. This is Jamaica. I, I've seen uh, in the visits to the Glasgow museums that you have some relation with Jamaica, and some of the big buildings here were made with money that came from the sugar cane there. So some of the places may have relationship with Jamaica, something I didn't know, of course, but I know now after I've been told that some of the luxuries come from the colonial times in which Glasgow uh, received uh, some ships. I don't know if they were with gold, with sugar or whatever, but they were used to build the city. This was uh, suggested to me by Marcili, who is a curator in London that is very related to the Caribbean. He said, you should also include the Caribbean. This is one case in which a, an African uh, Jamaican um, scholar and, investi and a researcher, very prominent at that time, called uh, Rodney, uh, <clears throat> Walter Rodney was an intellectual, an African Jamaican uh, thinker. He was coming back from a Canadian meeting with African writers and he wasn't authorized to come into Jamaica. So all this movement, the Rodney riots, claimed for him to be authorized to come and give his lectures in Jamaica. So that's how I knew, and this is a picture from the newspaper of Kingston, thegleaner.co. So I just pay the license, whatever, $300, it's okay. Okay, these two are the images that I mentioned about uh, intelligence service. Uh, that's why they have the numbers. The numbers identify the students or the militants that are in the marches in order for them to be prosecuted later. So these are uh, police images of the uh, Australian intelligence service. They were searched. Uh, by the Smart Film Limited, Moore Park in Australia, for the production of the TV series Persons of Interest that they made in Australia. So that's how I could get to them. Uh, this is one of the first times in which the Aboriginal flag of Australia is flown in the 72 March, because uh, at that time, there was no indigenous flag. It was created, uh, as it says here, by, uh, ab by the Aboriginal leader. Um, was it here? No. Yeah. Okay. There is in the caption information about the Aboriginal Australian that created this flag, which was flown then for the first time in this time, and now it is uh, shown together with the Australian flag all the time. This is uh, Dakar. Also, there are places where it's very difficult to find images, particularly Africa and the uh, Middle East, particularly all the Arab world. There's a lot of censorship uh, of those images because they are very politically charged. For instance, this image of the Dakar repression in 68 it was very difficult to find because curators and scholars in Dakar, in Senegal, search. No, there's nothing, they said. Uh, I could find these images in the files of AFP, the France, French, uh, France Press Agency, lost in a drawer. It's the first time they are published, in a way. And they show the shoes of the people that left the streets after the repression. The problem with these images is that the guy that ordered this repression is uh, Leopold Sedar Senghor, who is the father of the countryside, the father of the nation. Nobody wants to talk anything negative about him because there's no other leader that has been like half of him as good. But that doesn't mean that he didn't order the repression. So now I have a discussion with the curator at the Dakar Biennale if they want, he wants to show it, but 
It's paid for the state and it's a gore. It's 50 years. They don't want, they don't know. Still something 50 years ago, maybe it's better not to talk about it today. So these things happen with photography. Same thing in the Arab world. Very difficult to find images in Tunis, in Egypt. In Tunis, there was a big movement, Foucault, the French philosopher was teaching there. He wrote a lot about the 68 movement in Tunis. If you go to the web, you see a lot of Foucault text about the students in Tunis in 68. But you cannot get an image at all. And I couldn't get an image. I got one in Beirut, in which I mentioned about um, Tunis. But, OK, I started the research. So I contacted scholars from Tunis and from the Arab world in the US and in uh, in Beirut, uh, they know that the images are not available. Maybe not me, but them sometime in the future get to know what happened with those images because all the images exist. It's just a matter of time to finding them. This picture is particularly interesting for me in Bonn, and it is related with the one in London of the Che in the March because this picture shows in uh, May in Bonn, in the then capital of uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, which was you know, split in two, shows this image of February 68, one of the two most famous images of the Vietnam War, in which a uh, Viet Cong uh, guerrilla uh, fighter is shot by the chief of police of South Vietnam. General Guzhen Gok Loan is killing Guzhen Van Lem as known as they look. But what I'm interested in is the fact that how images circulated at that time. In February 68, the image of the shooting uh, happened. This image made the World Press Photo of the year. It was very famous. Although when I yesterday gave a lecture in the college here in Glasgow, no student knew this image. And they were photography students. And they didn't know anything about this image which is extremely famous in the history of photography. And the photographer, uh, Eddie Adams, got very famous after this picture. I don't know what he said about it, but I'm more interested in the shot itself. But I didn't have to license this one because this picture was in a bigger one in Bonn, in which three months after it was taken in Vietnam, it was already in the streets of Germany, which it's totally before internet, before faxes, before iPhones, all. But images circulated anyway. So it's also interesting to see how the circulation of images happens. Um, and therefore, this is one of the images I like. It has the Vietnam uh, flag, the Viet Cong flag, as it is here as well, in this London march uh, with Trafalgar at the back and all the open mouths of the people. So let me finish with a couple of Latin American images. <clears throat> Here we have Santiago de Chile, Montevideo, Mexico, Tucumán, which is the north of Argentina, Córdoba, Bogotá, Sao Paulo, and Rio de Janeiro. We had a lot of movement in Latin America at that time, the 60s. It was before the time of the dictatorships. It was more of a moment of social and political action in the streets that led to further uh, repressive moments as we suffered the dictatorships in the region in the 70s. Then this is one of the three pictures of Mexico that are in the book that relate to the Tlatelolco massacre and they refer also to Ayotzinapa. Mm -hmm. The connection between Tlatelolco and Ayotzinapa, these 43 students for me, is key. And now, in this moment, and until February 25th, all this work is shown uh, in one of the probably the most important exhibitions uh, in my life in Tlatelolco, which is the very same place where the massacre happened in the university memorial space there, big prints of three by two meters with all these images in a public installation place in the very same place of the massacre. And that is for the 50th anniversary of Tlatelolco. That's why it's a very big honor for me as an artist to be in that position. And then, well, we have Chile, Montevideo, which is the only photograph in which uh, it's a burial of a victim of the dictatorship. The second victim is now buried, is then buried in, in that march in Uruguay. 
Cordoba, 69, this, were the this was the social movement in Argentina that started the whole insurrection and social action that led to further bigger uh, political struggles in the 70s. Bogota, it's the beginning of the civil war that somehow ended last year with the peace talks between the government and the FARC. This is already uh, the, the students in the streets of Bogota. Sao Paulo, also with women, as in Rio, in the front. This picture of Rio is very interesting. It's becoming very seen in Brazil, this intervention, not only because of the women, which are famous actresses of the television, all dead now, but because here we have Mario Pedrosa, which is the most important art critic of Brazil in the 20th century, and he is marching in the picture. Therefore, everything comes together from an art perspective, that the art critic is with the ladies uh, in the street. And this picture today is also very strong because we have a very uh, bad political situation in Brazil where everything is going like back and a very strong right movement uh, impeaching the government and uh, restricting them. It's a very bad moment in Brazil. So when I had this show in, in Sao Paulo, <coughs> all this show, it was organized in a bank cultural center, Banco Itaú. So they would uh, uh, license the image for my work and pay for those rights, but restrict it. They would authorize the use of the picture in the exhibition, but they, don't, they didn't want it to be published in the press. So it wasn't released because now this picture is complicated. They don't want to show it. Okay, so with this, I finish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.